Uh, well, if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to be in Psalm 59. <clears throat> uh, I have been, I've been so excited about this name of God. I've been waiting for months just to get to this. Uh, and so I, I've been, uh, I mean, I've been, I've been excited about all of the names that we've been walking through as we were walking through the series. Uh, but I think of all the names, this, this is probably at the top of one of my all-time favorites. Uh, and it's probably one of his lesser-known names. Uh, and it's the name El Hesed. Uh, but it means the God of mercy and loving kindness. Uh, <clears throat> several years ago, um, I had stumbled across a book. And, and at this point, I don't even remember how I even heard of the book. Uh, but I ended up reading a book by Michael Card called Inexpressible, Hesed and the Mystery of God's Loving Kindness. And it's one of those books, I don't know if you've ever had this happen in your life, where you hear a concept or you hear an idea or you read a book and it like it forever changes the trajectory of your, of your thought process and of your life. And God used this really simple, small little book in my life to set me on like this incredible trajectory, specifically in this idea of the word hesed. And over the last several years, it's one of those things I keep returning to again and again and again, and I love to study it out. And the more I meditate upon it, the more big it gets. In fact, uh, in this last summer program, uh, we were walking through a, a slightly different session and we brought the idea of hesed and I just went off on this bunny trail and we ended up just throwing out the session and we just talked, just talked hesed. And then we got into the prodigal father story. And then we got into like, it just, this, it just gets so beautiful the more you get into this idea. And so we are not going to do it justice. I just thought at least clarify. Uh, I just, we're just going to skim the surface. Don't be mad at me, but you need to study this out. This concept, this word, and specifically even this name is so grand. It is so magnificent. Uh, I constantly stand in awe. Uh, in fact, I think this particular Hebrew word is becoming one of my all-time favorites because uh, it's just, it, it's so deep and it's just power and it's impact on my personal life. So let, let's get into this. Uh, in, in Psalm 59, <clears throat> one of the names of God that shows up, and it only shows up here in this way once, this word hesed shows up all the time with God in terms of his attributes and his character. But in one place in scripture, it actually becomes his name. And I just want to give this to you. In the context of Psalm 59, it says this is a Psalm of David, and it's when Saul sent men and they watched the house in order to put him to death. So the background is Saul is chasing and trying to kill David, which happened multiple times, right? But this is how David starts Psalm 59. Deliver me from my enemies, O my God. Set me securely on high away from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from workers of iniquity and save me from men of bloodshed. For behold, they have lain in wait for my soul. Fierce men launch an attack against me. So if you can imagine the scene, here, here's David. And he says, okay, Saul and his men are coming after me. They are seeking my head. And so what, what, is, what is David pleading? What, what is David's cry? God, you're, you're going to have to deliver me. God, I'm going to need your help. And as you work through the psalm, as you get into verse 10, this is what David said. My God in his loving kindness will approach me. God will let me look triumphantly upon my foes. And it's interesting, and most translators don't know what to do with the verse. So <laughs> it's like, uh, is it a name of God or is it an attribute of God? Yes. And so let me just give you a few other translations because maybe this will help us a little bit. And you'll notice that the word hesed is translated in a variety of ways, but, but I just want you to hear the, the undertone of this thing. So the King James says, the God of my mercy. The New King James says, my God of mercy. The Lexham English says, my God of loyal love. The ESV says, my God in his steadfast love. The Christian standard says, my faithful God. The net says, the God who loves me. It's interesting, it's being used as a name, it's El Hesed, and yet it's also attributal, which we've talked before, if you were following the early part of the, of the series, that when we talk about the names of God, we're not just talking about a name. Names, specifically in the Old Testament, but all throughout Scripture, the names were not just a name. Uh, today we call, you know, children like Bob and Susie and Josephine and Jaquita and Bertha, right? We have these great names that, that we call our children, but in the scriptures, a name wasn't just a name. A name was symbolic of character and nature and attribute. 
And so uh, when, when you said, hey, uh, this guy's name is Jacob, right? His name doesn't just mean Jacob. It means that his character is a heel grabber, a lying, deceiving manipulator. And guess what Jacob was? He was a lying, deceiving manipulator, which is why it's profound then that God changed Jacob's name. It's not just that God didn't like the name Jacob. God was changing character stuff. And so what you begin to see in scripture is that names are super significant. So as you get into specifically even this name, God is given a name and it's this idea of El Hesed, but the word Hesed, is it his name or is it his character? Yes. Which then begs the question, okay, what does even Hesed mean? Uh, oh, so, I, mean, I forgot the rest of the verse. Man, this is exciting. At the end of Psalm 59, this is how David wraps up the whole Psalm. Uh, he says, but as for me, I shall sing of your strength and I shall joyfully sing of your loving kindness in the morning for you have been my stronghold and a refuge in the day of my distress. Oh, my strength, I sing praises to you for God is my stronghold, the God who shows me loving kindness, the God who shows me hesed. Uh, that word hesed, uh, and sometimes you'll see it spelled with an H. Sometimes you see it spelled with a ch, the C-H, right? Because most Hebrew words have that ch. So if you just start choking, you're probably speaking Hebrew. Uh, just kidding. That's not true. <laughs> that's, that's, that was a bad joke. Uh, but anyway, the word, the word hesed uh, is interesting. In fact, most scholars say that hesed is one of the hardest Hebrew words to define. And I think legitimately there's over 80 different ways that you can translate the word hesed. So as a translator, then, <laughs> as you're working through the scriptures, and you're, you get to this word hesed and you're trying to translate it. It's like, how on earth do you translate this Hebrew concept? And it is so profound. It is so big uh, that the, I think that's why Michael Card titled his book Inexpressible. Because this idea of hesed truly is inexpressible. It is over the top. It, it is so profound. Uh, but let me just give you a few of the ways that it is most typically translated in the scriptures. It's translated as love or kindness. Uh, the New American Standard uses loving kindness. The ESV says steadfast love most often, but it can also be translated faithful love, loyalty, favor, mercy, beauty, righteous devotion, faithfulness, favor, gracious covenant, covenant loyalty, grace, goodness, loving instruction, and covenant friendship. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read through that list, I go, <clears throat> those are not all the same thing. And you're correct. And yet what is really profound about the word hesed is that it encapsulates all of these ideas. It's often used in covenant, but it's also this idea of loving kindness, uh, this, this constant loyal love that, that God is showing. Uh, when I was reading through that book by Michael Card, hands down, this was the best definition. This was his definition, trying to summarize the word hesed. And I, I really have clung to this because I, I just love how it's stated. But here's how Michael Card defines hesed. When the person from whom I have a right to expect nothing gives me everything. Isn't that a cool idea? When the person from whom I have a right to expect nothing gives me everything. So imagine this with, with God. I come to God and do you realize that I should not expect anything from my God. What, what I deserve is judgment. What, what I deserve is wrath. And so if I come to God and make any requests, I actually should expect nothing from him. Why? Because I don't deserve it. And yet from the one whom I should expect nothing, what, what does God do? God gives me everything. Or as 2 Peter 1.3 says that God gives me everything I need for life and godliness. And I can't think of anything I, I need outside of life and godliness. So in Jesus, then, I have everything I need for life and godliness. He has supplied everything, even though I should expect nothing. That's the idea of hesed. Isn't that a great thought? Now, when you look at this idea of hesed, or the word hesed, it shows up nearly 250 times throughout all the major parts of the Old Testament. In other words, it's in the law, the prophets, and the writings. And 127 of the times it's used, right? So we're talking about more than half. It's in the book of Psalms. And what's really neat, and we'll get to this, but 26 of those times, it's in one psalm alone, which tells you something. The psalms are, the, right, it's the book of praise. It's also the book of lament. 
And so what you find interesting in the book of Psalms is that whether it is a lament or whether it is praise, this idea of hesed becomes an undercurrent uh, of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the psalm. In fact, speaking of lament, let me just give you one quick paragraph from Michael Card. I thought this was interesting. He says, one of the fascinating features of biblical laments, which so captured my imagination, was the way everyone transitions. In other words, every lament in Scripture has a transition point, except for one. These psalms begin lamenting, which is still a form of worship. And then at some unpredictable point, they transition and begin to praise. This shift usually takes place by means of the Hebrew letter Vav, which is usually translated and or but. It is as if the lamenter finally exhausts himself and turns back to the God he was complaining to or about. And the only exception is Psalm 88, which is a lament all the way to the end. But every other lament has a transition point. It always ends in praise. So he goes on and says, in three important laments, Psalm 13, 69, and Lamentations, the word hesed appears at that transition point. Isn't that interesting? And it marks the transition from despair to hope, from emptiness to a new possibility of becoming filled once more. It's as if David and Jeremiah <clears throat> had run out of doubt and despair. They had run out of words except for this one untranslatable word. They could not exhaust its bottomless supply of hope. And by grace, it rose to the surface of their lament, transforming it to praise. Their self-centered eye mercifully became the God-centered thou. The pain and frustration and anger were not wiped away, but rather transformed by entering the world of this untranslatable three-letter, two-syllable word, hesed. And just for kicks, let me just give you those three laments where you see the transitions. In Psalm 13, verse 5, the transition point is, but I have trusted. Here's my lament. Here's my, here's my plea. Here's my difficulty, O God. But then David says, but I have trusted in your hesed. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Or Psalm 69, where David says, but as for me, my prayers to you, O Yahweh, at an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your hesed, answer me with the truth of your salvation. And Jeremiah says this in Lamentations. You know this one really well, actually. But this I will return to my heart. Therefore, I will wait in hope. The hesed of Yahweh indeed never ceases, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Do you realize that the hesed of our Lord is new every morning? That he is so good that though I deserve nothing from him, though I should expect nothing to get from him, he gives me everything. Well, when does that take place? It's new every morning. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, let me just give you a few places where this is found. This idea of hesed becomes a major theme throughout the entirety of Scripture. I, I really love this idea. Uh, in the book of Exodus, uh, Moses, is, uh, he, he comes to God, he gets the law, and, and I really wish we had time to unpack this. In fact, during the alumni summit of this last couple of weeks, uh, we spent a whole afternoon and we just unpacked this one passage. And it was so beautiful. But in, in Exodus 33, Moses goes to God and says this, I pray you, show me your glory. Now, pause. Could you imagine asking God for that? I mean, could, could you imagine the audacious request that Moses is making? He comes before the Lord and just says, God, I want to see your glory. And of course, you got to figure out what the glory that he's referring to is. But it's not just something. He's asking for the near and dear actual presence, the face of God himself. But here's Moses and he's crying out, God, show me your glory. And then God himself says, I myself, think about this, will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of Yahweh before you. So, so Moses says, God, show me your glory. And God says, okay, I'm going to pass before you and I'm going to literally unveil all of my goodness. And I don't know if you catched it or caught it, but all of the goodness of the Lord is contained in the name Yahweh. That name that God gave Moses at the burning bush in Exodus chapter three. And so get this idea. God's going to pass before Moses and God's going to say, I'm going to declare my name in front of you, my name Yahweh. And so in Exodus 34, that's what happens. Look at this. Yahweh passed in front of Moses and called out. Here's the, here's the fullness of God's goodness and the glory. Listen to this. Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim, compassionate and gracious, 
slow to anger and abounding in hesed and truth, who keeps hesed for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth. It's an incredible passage. And I wish we had time, like an hour or two, just to unpack it. Because the depth of this is so profound to me. And one of the things that I I was wrestling with, at least I was telling our alumni, was that uh, whenever I've quoted this verse, I always stop (laughs) halfway through through the quotation of God because I don't like the end. Look at, look at the end again. Who forgives iniquity. That's where I always stopped because I, I liked all that stuff. He forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, but then I, I didn't like the rest of this. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the grandchildren to the third and the fourth. And it sounds like God suddenly became a mean, nasty God again. And if you actually, and, and I'm, I'm proposing for you to study this out, because the moment you begin to study out what he's actually saying, it is not this mean, nasty It's actually so beautiful to me. And the fact that God is a God of holiness and mercy and love, and yet he is a God of judgment. And that's actually beautiful. But we don't have time to get into that. So you're going to have to study it out. Some of you look concerned. It's a phenomenal passage. This is a good thing. You should like, woo! So again, ponder this. God is revealing his goodness and his glory to Moses. And so what does he do? He declares the name Yahweh. And so he goes to Moses and says, Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim. And then he says, you know who I am? I'm gracious and compassionate. I am slow to anger. I abound in hesed and I keep my hesed for thousands. Do you realize that as God defines his character and his nature, the, the, the quality or the attribute that he quotes twice is hesed. He says, do you know who I am? I am the God that I, I, will, always, I will always go beyond what you expect. That you should expect nothing, and yet I will give you everything you need. I'm a God of great mercy and kindness and loving, loving kindness. I have, I have a loyal love and, and a covenant loyalty to those whom I call my own. Do you know how profound that is? That when God says, let me tell you who I am. I am El Hesed. I am the God of mercy and loving kindness. And I will keep that. I I abound in that. It's like a Niagara and waterfalls. You just cannot contain it. I am just going to go over the top. And this thing, I'm going to hold and keep to that, to my nature, which is Hesed. Uh, this idea of hesed then, as you begin to trace it through, becomes one of the major anthems and themes throughout the Old Testament. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, <clears throat> Moses is giving his final exhortation to the Israelites, and he says, You shall know, therefore, that Yahweh your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps his covenant and his hesed to a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Which you hear the echo, you hear that replay of Exodus 34 in that. Or you come into First Chronicles 16 and David is bringing the ark into Jerusalem. And what is the praise? What, what is the declaration that David is making in this praise and this excitement of bringing the ark of God in, into Jerusalem? David says, oh, give thanks to Yahweh for he is good. His hesed endures forever. Wouldn't it be neat if you understood that too? That God's hesed endures forever? And that theme that David declares, his hesed endures forever, that becomes one of the major songs or the anthems of ancient Israel. And that is repeated over and over and over and over again. And you begin to see it through the prophets. You see it through the Psalms. In fact, here's Solomon in the dedication of the temple, right? David had died. Uh, Solomon rebuilt the, or sorry, he, Solomon built the temple. And in the midst of the dedicating of the temple, Solomon stands up and says uh, at the altar of Yahweh before the assembly, he spreads his hands toward heaven and he said, Oh, Yahweh, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven, above or upon earth beneath, keeping covenant and hesed to your slaves who walk before you with all their heart. Do, do you begin to hear, like you hear these echoes of Exodus 34. You begin to hear this cry of David saying, Oh God, your, your hesed endures forever. 
Do you realize God's hesed does indeed endure forever? And, and by the way, do you know what the word forever in Hebrew means? Forever. Which doesn't mean that God's hesed stopped with David. God's hesed did not stop with Solomon. God's hesed did not stop after the time of Jesus. God's hesed endures even to this day. And guess what? Forever is forever, which means you can go 10 billion gazillion years into eternity and you realize God's hesed will still endure. He abounds and keeps his hesed. That's incredible, folks. Please contain your excitement. And I know it's early, but this is, this is incredible. Why? Because you know what I realize I don't need or what I don't deserve? I, I don't deserve mercy. I don't deserve loving kindness. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I have shook my fist in God's face in rebellion, and I demand in my own way. And yet while I was yet a sinner, and while I was shaking my fist in rebellion, do you know what God did? Christ died for me. Do you know what that's called? Hesed. That out of God's abundant mercy and kindness, God says, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. I'm going to give you what you need, which is me. And God's mercy always triumphs over judgment. That is so, that is such good news, folks. Meaning if I would just embrace his mercy, I will always experience his mercy, not his judgment. Please stay seated. But that's amazing. Look at this, Psalm 118. There's several psalms that are all about hesed. Psalm 118 is one of those. <clears throat> Listen to how it starts and how it ends. Give thanks to Yahweh, for he is good, for his loving kindness, his hesed endures forever, ever. Oh, let Israel say his hesed endures forever. Oh, let the house of Aaron say his hesed endures forever. Oh, let those who fear Yahweh say his hesed endures forever. And then at the end of the psalm, it says, you are my God and I give thanks to you. You are my God, I exalt you. Give thanks to Yahweh for he is good. His hesed endures forever. Uh, psalm 136 is one of my favorite psalms. I, whenever I take groups over to Israel, uh, we, we will usually pick one of two locations and we will declare Psalm 136 there. And I love Psalm 136 because it's a participatory psalm. This is exciting. And the way Psalm 136 was written is that at every single line of Psalm 136, the phrase, his hesed endures forever, shows up. And what's really neat is Psalm 136 recounts the history of Israel, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So whether it was the good times of Israel, the bad times of Israel, or the ugly times of Israel, the declaration is his hesed still endures forever. And can I encourage you to ponder that about your life? See, a lot of us look at our life and say, wow, man, things are going well. His hesed endures forever. But when things don't go well, it's like, where were you? God, why did you abandon me? God, why am I having all these problems? But do you realize that a biblical perspective is that God doesn't leave or forsake you? Hebrews 13, verse 5 and 6. So you begin to realize that just as the psalmist in Psalm 136 reminds us that whether it's a good time, a bad time, or an ugly time, it actually doesn't matter in your life because God's hesed endures forever. That his mercy and his loving kindness endures. That his faithfulness is new every morning. Are you getting this? So, it's a participatory psalm, which means you get to participate. And you know my games, if you don't participate, you have to sing a solo about whatever we're doing. So you, you got to participate this morning. And if you don't participate, I'm going to have you come up and sing a solo on Daily Thunder about Hesed. And you've got to make up the lyrics. So you might as well just participate. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to read Psalm 136. And uh, we're going we're gonna to use some different translations for the word Hesed, just so you can see kind of the progression and just see some of the depth, right? <clears throat> and so I'm going to read the first line and you read the bold line. Everyone good? All right, here we go. Give thanks to Yahweh, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, 
for his mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his mercy endures forever. To him who made the heavens with skill, for his mercy endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. To him who made the great lights, for his mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endures forever. And the moon and the stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures forever. All right, let's switch it up to loving kindness. To him who struck the Egyptians through their firstborn, for his loving kindness endures forever. Then brought Israel out from their midst, for his loving kindness endures forever. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm, for his loving kindness endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea in two, for his loving kindness endures forever. And made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his loving kindness endures forever. But he overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea, for his loving kindness endures forever. Let's go to faithfulness. To him who led his people through the wilderness, for his faithfulness endures forever. To him who struck great kings, for his faithfulness endures forever. And killed mighty kings, for his faithfulness endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his faithfulness endures forever. And Ah, king of Bashan, for his faithfulness endures forever. And gave their land as an inheritance, for his faithfulness endures forever. Even an inheritance to Israel, his servant, for his faithfulness endures forever. All right, let's just use the word hesed. Who remembered us in our lowest state, for his hesed endures forever. And has snatched us from our adversaries, for his hesed endures forever. Who gives food to all flesh, for his hesed endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, for his hesed endures forever. Isn't that beautiful? Do you realize that whether it was good, bad, or ugly, God's hesed endures forever. And God says, this isn't just some little attribute of who I am. This is who I am. My mercy will always triumph over judgment. That my name, Yahweh, is full of hesed. It abounds in hesed, and I keep hesed for a thousand generations. That I, that I will always, this thing will always endure. Now, as you come to the New Testament, uh, we obviously don't use the word hesed because that's a Hebrew term. The word in the New Testament that's often translated with this idea is the word mercy. I really like that. Now, mercy has a particular thought process in the modern church. But most of the time, for, for example, if you go back in the Old Testament, the Septuagint, and look at how the Greek translated the Hebrew, most of the time it's the word mercy. And so as you work through the New Testament, then what you begin to find is that there's this idea that here is Yahweh, the God of the universe, the triune God who comes in the flesh. And what do you see Jesus doing? Jesus is full of mercy. That, that Jesus is constantly walking around and showcasing the hesed of who he is as Yahweh. So let me just give you a couple of passages. In Ephesians, Paul is talking <clears throat> and he says this, but God, being rich in mercy, think about that, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our tres, tres, transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Do you realize that it's because of his hesed that you are even saved? It's by grace through faith. That's true. But for God so hesed the world that he gave or look at what Titus 3, verse 4 and 5 says. Paul declares, But when the kindness and the affection of our God and Savior appeared, he saved us, not by works, which we did in righteousness, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. And again, I've been quoting this, but James 2, 13, Mercy triumphs over judgment. Do you realize our God is a God of hesed? And that is very clear in the Old Testament. But as you come again in the New Testament, Yahweh God, who takes on flesh, his name is Jesus. Do you realize that he is demonstrating who he is as the God of Hesed? 
Uh, this is a really neat scene. Uh, but as you come into John chapter 5, there's this idea of the house of Hesed. And my guess is you've never seen it this way because we tend to not look up what the words mean. Uh, but there's such significance to names and the meanings and locations and all that kind of thing. Uh, let, me, let me just give you the quick story. And again, we're just going to skim the surface. Right? We're not, we don't have time to do a deep dive into this, but it is so incredibly beautiful. And there's a lot of fun irony happening in the passage that if you grew up in a Hebraic culture, you would just be like, oh, I get it. But since we didn't, let me just kind of give you a hint and then you can go study it. Ready for this? In John chapter five, verse one and two, it says, after these things, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by a sheep gate, by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethsaida, having five porticos. Now, if you ever been to Israel, uh, there is the sheep gate. You can still go through it today. And if you walk to the sheep gate and you go probably about 50 feet down past the sheep gate, uh, you see the temple mount and the dome of the rock on your left. But as you, as you, as you walk down this little path on this little street, you come across this entrance way into uh, St. Anne's, which is this uh, church that has perfect acoustics. So if you ever want to sing a great song, it's, it's a great, because the, the acoustics is perfect. I mean, it's, it literally was made that way. But right outside the door of St. Anne's, there, there is this place called Bethsaida. In fact, in archaeological digs, they found the five porticos. So th this is the location of this whole story. And it says that the place in Hebrew was called Bethsaida. Now, again, we, we typically in our modern day, we're like, okay, and we just keep on reading because what's the big deal with that? Do you know what the word Bethsaida means? Bet in, in Hebrew means house. And the word bet Seda actually could be better translated bet hesed because it's the, it's the same root and it means the house of mercy. So ponder this. Here is Jesus who is El Hesed. He's the one of mercy. And he's coming into a location called the house of mercy. Do you feel the tension already? So you have the one who is mercy coming into the house of mercy. And you know the story. In the house of mercy, there's all the lame and the beggars. And, and there's all these you know, paralytic people. And the rumor was is that when the water was stirred, the first one in the water would be healed. And everyone's waiting around the pool to be healed. What are they waiting for? Mercy. So you have, think about this, a location called the house of mercy. There's all these people wanting mercy. And then the one who is mercy shows up in the house of mercy. And then listen to this. Verse five, and a man was there who had been sick for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been sick a long time, Jesus said to them, said to him, do you wish to get well? That is a dumb question. Well, of course he wants to get well. Why else is he there? But then listen to what the man says. The man answered Jesus saying, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. What is the man saying? No one has ever shown me mercy. No one has ever reached around and just helped me into the water. No, I, I, I've been waiting in the house of mercy for mercy and I've never experienced mercy. So you have the one who is mercy in the house of mercy talking to someone who's desperate for mercy. And what does the man of mercy do? Heals him and gives mercy. Isn't that beautiful? You need to study that out. That's incredible. Uh, another one of these stories, by the way, this, this theme shows up all over the New Testament. And, and we are not we are not going into this because we do not have time. It takes about an hour for me to walk through the prodigal father story. Uh, and you, you've known it as the prodigal son story. But do you realize this story in Luke 15 is not about a prodigal son? It's about a prodigal father. The word prodigal just means extravagant or excessive. And, and we, we say it's the prodigal son story because the son goes off into, a wild, in, in, into another country and expends all of his money in wild living, in prodigal living. And yet what you realize is, yeah, that was excessive and that, that was extravagant. But do you realize that the whole story is actually not about either one of the sons. The whole story is about the mercy of the father. And do you recognize that the mercy of the father is so over the top? It is so crazy. The only way you can describe the mercy and the love and the forgiveness of the father is that it's prodigal. It's excessive. It's extravagant. 
And so I decided I'm changing the name. And the name's not biblical anyway. It's just a little black title on most, you know, most of our headers. But it's not the prodigal son story. It's a prodigal father story. And, if you, and I, I, wish we had, I wish we had the hour to actually walk through it because it is so stirring to me. It is, it is, it is ah, you need to study this out. There's a part of me that's like, let's throw off everything else today. Let's just do the prodigal father. We don't have time. But you need to study this out. And if you would look at it from its cultural perspective, we miss a lot of the ahas and the profundity of the story because we don't see it in light of the Jewish culture thing. It is so deeply impactful when you begin to recognize the beauty of that father's work. But I just, I just want to just read a passage. And again, you're going to have to study this out. But the son has spent all, the, all that he has on wild living and he comes to his senses and he just says, what am I doing? Even my father's hired hands. Those guys who just kind of stand by the street corner, they're not sure they're going to get hired that day. And they're just, you know, the guy comes around and says, hey, anybody looking for a job? And they're like, hey, pick me, pick me, pick me. Those, those are the hired hand guys. And the prodigal says, even those guys are living better than I'm living. So I'll go back to my dad and say, dad, will you just, I'll stand on the street corner and just once in a while, will you pick me and let me work for you? And just, and so the son's making his way home. And as he just rounds the corner, the father, who had obviously been anticipating and longing for the son because he's watching. And the moment he sees the son, look at this, it uh, says that, he, that the son rose up and went, came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And what did the father feel? Compassion, mercy. And he ran and embraced and he kissed him. And he said to the son, or sorry, the, the son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quick. Dude, he, stopped the, he stopped the son mid-sentence. Didn't even let the son finish the statement. He just said, Shh, be quiet. Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him and bring out a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring out the fattened calf and slaughter it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come back to life again. He was lost and had been found and they began to celebrate. Do you know what that's a picture of? Hasid. And when you start to look at the life of Jesus and you start to look at a lot of the things that he said and the parables that he told, there is this constant undercurrent of Hesed. Our God is a God of Hesed. That though I should expect nothing from him, he gives me everything. What would it look like if we embraced him like that? What would it, what would it, what would it mean practically for our lives if we just went, wow. Our God is a God of great mercy. That he is full of loving kindness and steadfast love. That he abounds in Hesed and he keeps Hesed to a thousand generations. That this is his heart and his nature. Yes, he's a God of righteousness and holiness and truth. Yes, he will bring judgment and, right, uh, and, and, judgment and wrath. But do you realize that his longing is not for you to be judged. His longing is for you to receive his mercy. And if you would just embrace his mercy, the mercy will always triumph over judgment. God doesn't want to smash you into the ground, flick you into the abyss, burn, baby, burn. That, that's not his heart. What does God want to do? God wants to shower you with his grace and his mercy. He wants to supply that which you desperately need. Our God is El Hesed, who came as a man and demonstrated Hesed. So just really quick, Two quick practicals. Number one, would you experience the Hesed of our Lord? He is Hesed. He abounds in Hesed and keeps his Hesed, and he wants to show forth his Hesed in your life. Whether it's the good times, the bad times, or the ugly times, would you experience that his Hesed truly does indeed endure forever? That his kindness endures forever. His mercy endures forever. His faithfulness endures forever. His hesed endures forever. Look at Hebrews 4.16. The writer of Hebrews says this, therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Do you realize that because of the cross of Christ that we now have constant access to the throne room of grace. And we have an endless supply of hesed at our disposal. Would you experience it? 
not just sing about it, not just declare it, would you actually experience the reality of the nature of our precious Savior and experience the hesed of our Lord? And number two, not just experience his hesed, but would you actually be filled with his hesed and let your life be known by hesed? It's interesting, the idea of hesed, it's primarily used to talk about God, but there's all these little scenes where someone is known by their hesed. Abraham was known for his hesed. David was known for his hesed. Wouldn't it be neat if you were so filled with the hesed of the Lord that you were known for hesed? That someone will walk up to you and though they should expect nothing from you, you actually just give them everything? That you're just constantly just showing mercy and kindness and love and faithfulness to the people around you? Not just friends, but enemies, strangers. See, what if your life was so full of his life that you just couldn't help but demonstrate hesed to the world around you? I love what Proverbs 19 verse 22 says, what is desirable in a man is his hesed. Do you realize that what is actually desirable in a human life is hesed? And I find this just super fun, but a name again is not just a name. A name is symbolic of character and nature. And in scripture, did you know that there are, there are two guys who actually had the name hesed in their name? One is in 1 Kings 4.10, the other one's in 1 Chronicles 3.20. But wouldn't it be neat if you were so full of hesed that someone's like, I'm going to start calling you Ben Hesed, the son of Hesed, because he is Hesed and so are you. Wouldn't it be neat to be so wrapped up in God's Hesed that the world's interaction with your life is that you were full of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self control, and that they're just overwhelmed with the Hesed of the Lord being demonstrated in and out of your life? We need that in our generation. We need to be men and women who experience the hesed of our Lord. And we need our world to experience the hesed of our Lord through us. Would you go after him? Would you embrace his mercy? Pray with me. Jesus, we just love you. Man, thank you that you are a God of hesed. You don't just have a little bit of hesed. You abound in hesed and truth. And that you keep your hesed for a thousand generations. Lord, I pray that we would not just esteem your hesed, but that, Lord, we would just be overwhelmed by it, that we would experience the depth and the richness of your mercy. And, Lord, could, could you do something so radical in our life that the world would see you in and through us, that they would see your life just emanating out of us because we are so full of Christ Jesus. Lord, thank you that you are El Hesed, and that while I was yet a sinner, because of your great hesed, you died for me. And Lord, I, I want to worship you this morning. I don't want to just sing a song. I don't, I don't want to just hum along. I, I don't, Lord, I want to be lost in the reality of who you are. And I just want to sing praise to you. I don't care if it's on key or off key. Lord, I just want to declare the wonders of who you are, that you are a God of hesed, and your hesed endures forever. We love you. In your precious name we pray. Amen.